Welcome back to The Bourbon Lens. This is Jake, and we are having to do our first re-recording ever. So um, we are gracious enough to be joined by Nelson Eddy, who is Jack Daniels' historian. And that is going to lead to a, a great conversation today. But first, you know, I just want to say thank you again, Nelson, for working with us to, you know, make this happen uh, after our first technology snafu in over almost 200 episodes. So really appreciate you making time for us today. No problem. You know, I don't know. That show is so brilliant with so many uh, facts that had never been told, stories that had never been heard. I don't think we're going to be able to recreate it, but I guess we'll try. Uh, we'll, we'll try. And you know what the great thing about this is? I don't think either of us remember exactly what was said. So we will we will go with it as uh, this is our first time ever talking and, and that will create the conversation. But really appreciate this. As everyone knows, Jack Daniels is an iconic brand. There's a lot of innovation coming out of, of Jack Daniels right off the bat. Um, so we'll, we'll hit on a few of those things. Super excited to uh, have tried the new limited releases and have actually reviewed both of those rye whiskeys, which were really well done. So check out bourbonlens.com for those reviews. But first, Nelson, when you think about Jack Daniels and history, that's a lot to unpack. So why were you the right man for the job for uh, Jack Daniels? And, and how lucky were you to kind of fill this role over the many years of, of working for the company? Well, I, I've been very fortunate. I'm very fortunate to have this role. In 1987, when I began working with them to help introduce Gentleman Jack, it was their first new brand in the century. And, you know, you just talked about two limited releases uh, we've had Jack Daniels uh, Bonded and Jack Daniels Triple Mash come out. They're going to be a part of the regular line. So there's a lot happening. But back then, it was one in a century. Mm. And uh, little did I know, I was a, a little junior copywriter. And I had no idea at that point it would this brand would become my career and really uh, be my life. Um, but, but the way I was selected, it's you kind of work yourself into a job. Um, so when I started out, one of the things I had to do since Jack Daniels bases a lot of its, its, uh, new products on its history, I was expected to do a lot of research as a copywriter. And so I met the very first marketing director. He was still, he was an executive vice president now with the company. His name's Art Hancock. He lives in Nashville. He's still alive today, but he was hired by the Motlows. That's before Brown Foreman was in the picture. Prior to 1956, he was hired by the Montlows to be the first person to market the brand. Up until that point, they could sell every drop they had. And uh, very soon after that, it would be the same. Mm -hmm. uh, they could sell every drop they had. So he uh, shared with me all of his old files, uh, told me stories, uh, really took me under his wing. And then as that relationship progressed, eventually when he got to retirement, he left all of his files with me. And that's really the backbone of what I have from a historical nature. And it's not unusual for writers. Uh, I mean, I think most of great writing is great research. Mm. Uh, you don't have great information uh, to begin with, even if it's fiction, you're a historical novelist. You've got to have a lot of great information to begin and so it, that love, I actually like researching more than I do writing. Writing's hard. You stare at a blank page or a blank screen and um, you got to make something happen. <laughs> so, anyhow, through all that research, by spending time with the old timers, uh, I eventually was given the title of Jack Daniels Historian. And I will tell you, that says something about a brand. It says, number one, they care about their history mm -hmm. uh, and they have a respect for it. And number two, it there's not. I can't think of another brand today. Maybe Old Forester. I can't think of another brand today with a historian that's kind of on staff for the brand. Yeah, and that's Jack Daniels has a history. It's it's not you know product sourced from somewhere else and a label put on it. Yeah. It, it, yeah, and when you think about iconic brands, right? Like Jack Daniels sits right up there, and it's it's you know, with Jim, right? Jack and Jim are, are two of the great stories. And I guess they don't really need to hire a historian over there because the whole family <laughs> works at the company. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it's really important when you have this fictitious figure almost uh, that is Jack Daniels. And, and I think that's what we really want to uncover today is there's, there's a lot of mystique and 
you know, really unknowns about this gentleman as as he was a as he becomes a larger in life figure over time. And one of that one of those things is his childhood. Like, how does you know Jack Daniels, whose name is not really Jack Daniels, right? Like, how does he kind of fall into this whole whiskey business? Um, you know, is, is kind of I think the first untold story that a lot of people don't know. So, could you share a little bit about that? Sure, sure. And and you're right. He it wasn't really tough for Jack's reputation to be larger than life because he only stood five foot two. <laughs> so it's not hard for reputation to have a greater stature when you're that that short. But be that it may, even that plays into it. I think he was one of those people that tried harder and worked harder uh, to make up, maybe even for the fact he was diminutive in size. And that's why he was called the boy distiller or the gentleman distiller, just because of his size. But when he starts out, um, he leaves home at an early age. Uh, he's the last of 10 kids, and his mother will pass away soon after his birth. And you know what any smart guy does when he has 10 kids and he's lost his wife? He finds a new one. Yeah. I mean, pronto. And so uh, Jack's dad remarries. And apparently Jack does not, as he ages, he doesn't get along with this, uh, doesn't get along with his stepmother. And so he leaves home and he goes first to a neighbor. And we've got to remember, too, in this time period, kids are loved, but they're considered labor. Mm. And the reason, you know, Callaway Daniel, Jack's father, had 10 kids was because he had a farm. So kids are labor. So Jack goes to work at a neighbor's farm and then eventually meets Dan Call, who's the local Lutheran minister. Dan Call has a young family. He's got a farm. He's got a general store. He preaches on Sunday, and he's got a still. So he can't handle all that. There are slaves on the property, and one of those enslaved individuals is a man named uh, uh, Nearest Green. Um, and the reason I stumbled there for a second is because both Jack and Nearest are not their names. Uh, it's Jasper, Newt, and Daniel. And we're really glad people called him Jack, because I don't think we'd sell much Jasper Newton. And then uh, nearest real nickname or real name was Nathan, Nathan Green. So Nathan Green and Jasper Newton Daniel. Um, Nathan is enslaved on the Dan Call property, and he's working at the still. He would be what we a uh, head distiller. He was head of the operation. And so when Jack comes to live with Dan Call, he gravitates to the still. And he works alongside of Nearest. And Dan Call gives Nearest uh, the instruction, you know, look, you know, teach Jack everything you know, and I'll teach him what I know about whiskey making. Because the Call family was a whiskey making family, too. Mm -hmm. I think the family is still making whiskey in North Carolina, yeah. the, the Call family distillers. But anyhow, be that as it may, Jack will learn from Nearest Green. And all that information comes from probably the most accurate source we have of, uh, of stories. There wasn't a whole lot recorded. Um, we do have census data with, with Nearest and Jack in it. But a lot of that comes from a book called The Jack Daniels Legacy. It was written by Ben Green in the 1960s. And he interviewed people that would have been alive at Jack's, in Jack's time period. Mm. So that, that's about, uh, and then that story's in there about Nearest. And uh, so Jack learns from Nearest. Dan Cobb will actually leave the two in charge of that. Still, he goes off to fight the Civil War. And then after the war, there's kind of a religious revival, and his church and his wife, who never liked him in the distilling business to begin with, said, look, Dan, you're going to have to choose between whiskey making you know, one of your two spiritual pursuits, whiskey making or religion. And uh, much to the later call family chagrin, he will choose religion over whiskey making and eventually sell uh, the still to Jack. But Jack keeps making whiskey on the Dan Call property. He will establish his distillery on the Dan Call farm in 1866 with Nearest as his head distiller, or what we would refer to as a master distiller today. Master distiller has been a name that's really been invented in my lifetime. Yeah. Uh, back in Jack's day, you were a head distiller. 
And there wasn't as big a fascination in who was making the whiskey as there is today. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've also got to remember Jack's first still was a pot still on a farm. Yeah. It wasn't a big distillery. Uh, that will come later. So he'll move to the Cave Spring, which is where we are today. He moves there between 1880 and 1884, and we've been there ever since, uh, making whiskey the way Jack and Nearest made whiskey. And um, that's really the beginnings. And a lot of people don't know that story. I think more and more people know the Nearest story today because uh, there was a New York Times story about it done in 2016. And then Fawn Weaver, who has done a lot of research and been very good to share it with us, um, has opened a visitor's center and is opening a distillery, um, the Uncle Nearest Distillery. Yeah. And they're making a very good product uh, called Uncle Nearest. Yeah. And I think that's what's really cool is um, Jack was, you know, from from what we talked about previously, he was a, a man of the people. He got along with the people really well. And so for him to have the ambition to see past the racism and the struggles that were happening in the 1800s uh, and for him to partner with nearest, like that's such a people thing to do, right? Like he was about, you know, um, Hey, this guy gave me all the knowledge he could. Hey, we need to keep this thing running as much as we possibly can to produce the whiskey. So, you know, as, as Jack and, and nearest kind of really kind of embark on this next adventure together, there's a lot of things that have to happen, right? Like the distillery has to be built, uh, and whiskey has to be made. And, um, you know, there's, there's wars that are going to be fought, uh, through that process and a little thing called, uh, prohibition that will happen. So as Jack ramps up, uh, and heads to, to where you all are, like what challenges would he have been facing in, in that day and age to, you know, really kind of rise to fame? Well, and, and a couple of things. Uh, yes, uh, it, it would have been challenging. And we'll talk about a couple of those challenges. One thing first, you mentioned the relationship between Jack and Nearest. And this is something that both Jack Daniels and Uncle Nearest and Vaughn Weaver talk a lot about. There's a photo of Jack's crew that really kind of illustrates or highlights the unique relationship. Now, we weren't there and we, we don't the only writings we have suggested there was a relationship, some kind of mentorship and friendship. Um, by the time Nearest will come to the Jack Daniel distillery, it's after emancipation. So he will be freed and he will be hired. Um, and so there's a picture of Jack's crew that was taken at the turn of the century. And it, it, for a long time, it was a mystery because to Jack's right was an African-American. Mm. And that would have not happened in any uh, company shot or distilleries crew shot at the turn of the century in the American South. Yeah, that just wouldn't have happened. So we wondered who is that guy? We didn't know for years, but the the Green family has identified him as George Green, one of Nearest's sons. Mm. Uh, Jack, Jack was probably even closer to Nearest's two sons, George and Eli, than he was to Nearest. Nearest was more of a mentor. They were more his age. Um, nearest will not come when the, with Jack to the new property at the Cave Spring, but his two sons will. And since that day, since Nearest to today, we've always had a member of the Green family working at the Jack Daniels Distillery. Today, there's three. So there's really um, there's a bond there between yeah. family and the Motlows and the Daniels uh, that goes back all the way to Nearest. Um, but anyhow, I just wanted to talk a little more about that. The challenges, a couple. You know, during the Civil War, uh, just before Jack starts, and still sometime after when they're recovering, corn becomes a problem. You know, having enough corn uh, to do all the things you wanted to do just to to live on, you ha you had to have enough to make whiskey. Yeah. Um, there were hailstorms in the area that destroyed at least one other distiller. Um, labor, labor would be a challenge because now, um, and rightly so, and well, it should have been long, long before, um, you, everybody was paid, Yeah, everybody was paid. And so, um, the, all of those things would have been challenged. Water source is another one. It was a challenge for Jack Daniels. That's why he moved from the Dan Call farm to where we are today. 
um, the Cave Spring Hollow. That was, there were distillers there before Jack got there, and he just bided his time. And when he could, in 1884, he finally buys the pub. He may have leased it before then, but 1884, he buys it. Mm. And that spring, today, you know, we make, we make, around 20 million cases of whiskey a year. Just a every few. Drop. Just a few. Just a few. And every drop comes from that cave spring, the water from that cave spring. And so when people go, will it ever run dry? I say, well, you see it flowing now? That's excess water. We're making all this whiskey, and the water you see flowing today is excess. So water is always a challenge, and cold water for a distiller yeah. who did not have you know, chillers he had to use cold water to chill uh, the snake. So anyhow, the, that's kind of uh, that's kind of the challenges. Yeah, and and so like these challenges are stacked against them. But but Jack, you know, gains prominence, right? Like people start to enjoy his whiskey relatively all around him, right? Um, it's distribution is going to be a lot harder, right? Then than it is yeah. now, right? But people start to enjoy Jack and he and produces more and more for for the people to to consume. But not only was Jack seemed to be a, a good whiskey maker and put the right people in place to continue making good whiskey, he was a pretty good marketer as well. Um and and added uh really some some nice colors and and things to 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 get that. So from a perception, was Jack just as good of a, a marketer as he was a whiskey maker? Or was he a better marketer than he was a whiskey maker? Well, let's put it this way. There were 15 different distilleries in that area. He was not the biggest uh, until about 1900. He wasn't the biggest. And even in 1900, he wasn't the biggest distiller in Tennessee. But um, he's the one of two and the only distillery with a direct line back to that time period that remains today. Yeah. And, and that. Well, I, I think Jack, uh, I don't know if he was a better marketer than whiskey maker because it's hard to argue with the product, Yeah, but he was, he was exceptional. Uh, he was very exceptional. And so was Len Motlow, his ne nephew after him. And um, yeah. I think marketing is a huge part of it. Yeah. So, you know, you, you talk, uh, there's, there's a lot that goes into Jack Daniels that a lot of people don't know. Right. So we, we, we've covered a lot, a lot of history, um, prior right. to, um, prohibition, but you know, some of the things that, that people always ask, and you probably get asked this often are like, where did old number seven come from? I think that's like the most prominent number, uh, that or prominent thing that people know about Jack Daniels other than the colors. And we'll get to that in a second, but you know, where did that old number seven come from? You're right. That is the most asked question we get on tour at the Jack Daniels distillery. Maybe the most asked question we get period around the world is why the old number seven? And there are a lot of theories. I mean, some people have said when Jack was coming up with old number seven, it was the seventh batch of whiskey. And so he called it old number seven uh, because he was quite a ladies man. He never married, but he, we have some of his love letters. He courted quite a bit. And some people said, well, uh, his seventh girlfriend was his favorite. If that story is true, I know why Jack never got married. Because if you call your favorite girlfriend old number seven, yeah. you're not getting married. You know, no. That's not happening. Some people said it was lucky number seven. Some people said it was a tax stamp of a prior tax district he was in. There's all kinds of theories. But I'll tell you what the truth is. The truth is we don't know because yeah. Jack didn't tell us. So, yeah. So, you know, like when, when you have that, like, you know, for you all from an education standpoint, you know, I think the truth will set you free a lot of times, right? You can perpetuate uh, the larger than life story, or you can just say, hey, we don't know. Uh, and how does that received, you know, when you all say like, hey, we just don't have any factual evidence on what it even means? Well, I, people kind of like making up their own stories. Mm. You know, I get new stories on old number seven from people all the time. And there's many people who just believe with beyond a shadow of a doubt, theirs is the real story. And that's all fine and dandy, but Jack is not responding to any of this. So <laughs> we have no idea. Hey, he had a he had a number two brand whiskey too that he made. 
Um, so that wasn't the only number. He did a Bell of Lincoln. He did a, a number of different labels, but that was the one that really stuck, that old number seven. Yeah. And so I, I think what's also iconic about the brand around the old number seven, but it's also the the really pristine black and white colors, right? It it, it pops on a on a on a bar back. It also pops, you know, at a at a on a liquor shelf. But if I remember right, that wasn't actually the original first colors of the bottle. No, no, it wasn't. Um, you know, now Jack goes back to selling whiskey by the barrel. Bottling will come later. Yeah. Um, and so, and his at first bottles didn't have a label. It had kind of, you know, raised type in glass mm-hmm. on the bottle, which if you look at our triple mash and our bonded whiskey, you'll see that same treatment there. But when this label is introduced, his first label is green. Now, this may confuse people because we do have in a limited amount of states a green label whiskey, a Jack Daniels green label. And you, it's the color of the label, and it's pretty much the style of the label that goes back, back to this original time period. And that confuses people because over time, old number seven black label became the more mature whiskey. Mm. After Prohibition to start cash flow, Lem Motlow did two things. He introduced Lem Motlow one-year-old whiskey, and he made Green Label a little less mature mm. to get cash flow. He did not want to, to harm that Jack Daniels old number seven black label. He wanted that to be the, the primo whiskey uh, after Prohibition. Um, so black label overtook uh, Green Label in terms of, uh, prominence. Mm. Yeah. And, and now the green label stands really strong, you know, uh, in line with the, the rye whiskey that you all are, are putting out in the market, uh, and especially in the, the barrel strength and the, in the special bottle and all those things. Um, and so it does have a place, right? The, the green hasn't lost its heritage or, or familiarity well, green today means rye. Yeah. I mean, most of the product that's a rye has a green label and ours follows suit, but we still today have a green label uh, Tennessee whiskey. Um, it's something that we have less and less of need for. And in that whiskey, if we'll just let it mature a year or two or three longer, year or two, really, uh, it'll become Jack Daniels old number seven. It's just a little less mature. Well, Hey, you got, you got to, now everyone's got to go hunt the green label, uh, Jack Daniels. You can find it, uh, somewhere. Um, we won't come to Tennessee and come to Tennessee. You can find it. And I think they probably have it in Lynchburg. There you go. So, you know, speaking of, right. One of the other big myths around things is, Hey, Lynchburg's a dry County. Like how, how, how does he build a whiskey empire in, in a, in a dry County? Like, is that, is that still, is that true? First of all, and is that true still today? It still is technically a dry county, though I'd call it a moist county. Uh, there's some, you know, wet places. Like, for example, you can buy a souvenir bottle of Jack Daniels at the distillery, but you can't buy that bottle on the square or anywhere in town. Um, and you can't have liquor by the drink in town. So it's what I call a moist county. You can get beer in it, but you can't have liquor by the drink. You can buy it from the distillery. But You know, we've made sure um, that the distillery doesn't become a liquor store for the county. In fact, everybody in the county, everybody that works at Jack Daniels will tell you the nearest liquor store is 12 miles, uh, six steps in one screen door. And that's Tullahoma. They all have it memorized. Um, (laughs) But, you know, in Jack's day, it was not a dry county. Mm. That would come later with Prohibition. It was it was a very, very, very wet county. Fifteen different distilleries. Jack himself had two bars on the square, the White Rabbit and the Red Dog Saloon. Um, but then Prohibition will hit in Tennessee very, very early. Tennessee goes dry by uh, law. The law is passed in 1909. And by 1910, the, the state is bone dry. Wow. So they, they adopted it quick. Um, and so, you know, as, as Jack goes through that, like, how does he navigate prohibition for, for whiskey making? Okay. Well, this gets back into one of those other kind of, uh, pieces of lore 
Mm. And that's how did Jack die? Because he will die. Well, he won't die until 1911, but he will incapacitate himself and the complications from his injury will lead to his death. So around 1906, I believe it is, Jack comes into the office early. Lem Motlow, his nephew, usually opens the safe for him. But he comes in early this morning. He sits down to open the safe. He can't get it open. He works the combination once. Can't get it open. He works it again. After the third try, Jack had a very short uh, temper. And so when he couldn't get it open, he hauls off and kicks the safe. And he breaks his big toe, mm. but he doesn't tell anybody because he's also a very proud man. So he, he limps around for a while, doesn't go to the doctor. And eventually, uh, Jack may have been diabetic. We don't know. He may have had circulatory problems, but gangrene will set in on this toe. They'll remove the toe, but the gangrene will spread. And later, they'll eventually remove his entire leg. Mm. So... You know, we don't get into those gruesome details on the tour. We say Jack kicked the safe and that's what killed him. And complications from all those surgeries and that gangrene and blood poisoning eventually left to his demise in 1911. Having said that, that's why in 1907, he deeds the distillery over to two of his nephews, one of them being Lem Motlow, who buys out his other uh, cousin, Dick Daniel. And Lem is left with the distillery, and it's Lem that guides us through prohibition. Mm. So, so you know, how, how do we get? Go ahead. Oh no! So, so how old is Jack around this point? Or like, because that's another. I know it's a, it's a, yeah. it's a mystery, right? To to kind of dive into that, but like, what's his age range to believe to be when he passes away? Okay, his his tombstone and his statue that Lem, or his nephew, erected. We'll say 1850s when he's born. Census data will tell us it's 1848. The fact his mother dies in 1849 also leads us to believe the 1850 date isn't right. Mm. Of course. Uh, but, uh, so 1848. So in 1906, he's what? 68? So he's got a pretty good life for people yeah. of, of that that age, right? Like, or of that the time period, yeah. like... <laughs> getting Actually, close to 70 no, he's 58 58, he's 58 but i mean he's getting close to 60 right so like i mean that's that's a pretty good time frame considering like he lived through the civil war and you know world war one was um you know on the precipice right for, for his time period and what he faced he had a good long life um but he will die because of the complications, just a few. He'll be in his early 60s when he passes away. Mm. But he kicked the safe in his late 50s. Um, and so it's Lem Motlow who guides us through Prohibition. And Lem, uh, to this day, you can find buildings marked Jack Daniels in both St. Louis and in Birmingham. Mm. Uh, he'll set up shop outside of the state in St. Louis and in Birmingham. In Birmingham, he has a brother, Lem has a brother called Spoon Motlow. Nicknames are big, <laughs> um, Tennessee. So Spoon Motlow, and he will go into business as um, uh, Motlow Brothers Distilling. Mm. And they'll produce a rye. Our rye goes back, you know, uh, we have history with rye, and it goes back to the Motlow Brothers. And then in St. Louis, he'll open the Jack Daniels Distillery. A fire in St. Louis will close that distillery. And then uh, he tries to reopen. Well, going back, fire closes it. He goes down to Alabama. Alabama goes dry. He's in St. Louis again. The country goes dry and he just stops. Mm. He sells his whiskey stock and he basically gets through prohibition, raising mules, raising Tennessee walking horses, uh, selling farm implements. He has a big farm that will help him commercially. And on the square, he'll have a hardware store. He does all that stuff. One key thing that's interesting is that he does it all under the name of Jack Daniels proprietor or Jack Daniels Lem Motlow proprietor. So he's doing business under that brand name. And the reason I bring that up is after Prohibition, when it uh, repealed in 1933, the state of Tennessee does not allow Lem to go back to whiskey making. It won't change its laws 
until 1938. So there's five years there. And in that five-year period, there's a company in New York that wants to produce Jack Daniels whiskey and use the trademark. And Lamb successfully defends his ownership of the trademark by saying, I've been operating my business under that name all the way through prohibition. Mm. So he'll win. Otherwise, you know, Jack Daniels trademark would have been taken over, but Lem Motlow defended it. So, I mean, not only does, does Jack have some, some mystery behind it, the brand does too, right? Because oh, yeah. if he doesn't have this kind of forethought to think about trademarks and, and things like that, like he could have easily lost the name brand and, and Jack Daniels might not be what it is today. I think, you know, there's, I, I think you're totally right. There's a magic to Jack Daniels. First of all, it's a really good product that's unique. Mm. You can take a, a, several bourbons and put Jack Daniels among those bourbons. And when you get to Jack Daniels, the bourbons will vary in taste, but there'll be a general character that you'll understand. But when you hit Jack Daniels, you go, that's completely different. And if you don't believe me, do that test yourself at home. When you get to it, so the product's real good, but it's in this square package, which was more unusual in Jack's day. It's been uh, kind of copied since, mm-hmm. but in this square package has a black label, has this unique number. I think rock and roll musicians and singers really gravitated to that square bottle black label. I think, you know, black is the fashion cover color of rock and roll. Yeah. Uh, it all works together and it's made it this incredible brand. Yeah. Well, and, and, and you say something that's really interesting about how Jack Daniels crosses um, pop culture. And we'll, we're going to have Nelson back on to, to do an intersection of this a little bit later. Um, what we're going to do, I'm teasing part two. But, you know, one of the things that, that picks up, though, is, is Frank Sinatra um, really kind of takes Jack Daniels in as, as his drink of choice. Um, and there's others like that. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about, like, how culture kind of gravitated to this bottle of whiskey? Well, it- You know, in Frank Sinatra's day, as Frank Sinatra starts out, Jack Daniels is in short supply. It can't be found. And here's another, you know, you're into myth and lore. Here's another myth that gets busted. And it's been within my lifetime. Um, It's history doesn't change. It's our understanding of it that changes. So for years, we said Jackie Gleason introduced uh, uh, Frank Sinatra to to Jack Daniels. It's in books. It's been published in articles. Well, just a a year or two ago, um, Frank Sinatra Enterprises sent us uh, a copy of an audio tape of Frank from stage telling the crowd that he was introduced to Jack Daniels by Humphrey Bogart. Which makes total sense. Yeah. And is it's a much better story, but Humphrey Bogart, and some people might not know this, they know Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack, yep. Sammy Davis Jr., Dean Martin, you know, this rollicking, frolicking men's club that just had a cocktail party, uh, you know, 24 by 7. Um, the, first, the first Rat Pack was Humphrey Bogart's Rat Pack. Mm. And Frank Sinatra became a part of that, and it got its name because... Lauren Bacall's kind of disgusted at the group of guys said, you're nothing but a pack of rats. <laughs> and instead of an insult, they said, wow, that sounds pretty good. It becomes the Rat Pack. So Frank Sinatra's Rat Pack is part two. Mm. But he's introduced to Jack Daniels by Humphrey Bogart. So I, I find that very interesting, right? Because it, it's always like uh, the first one may not have as much success as the second one. And, you know, those guys, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Sammy Davis Jr. and Frank are in Frank Sinatra, obviously are larger than life characters and caricatures uh, to this day. And, and, and that is almost how Jack Daniels has become. People see him as this stately gentleman um, and that he's larger than life. But we've talked about his height. We've talked about like his temper, uh, his kind of subtle upbringing, you know, living in a, a, a family community of faith and distilling, right? That's 
an odd combination, but you know, it, it is what it is. Um, and so like he becomes almost a caricature of himself, uh, and the brand then is propelled to this higher elevated status. I, it, that's, is that, is that how you feel like kind of looking at all the data over, over time? Well, I would tell you, you know, Jack Daniels dressed to the nines. He had a Patek Philippe watch. He had an upstairs ballroom at his house and a Steinway uh, piano. So he was quite the gentleman. We would say today that he's more of a gentleman Jack drinker than a Jack Daniels old number seven. The, the persona we know as old number seven has been largely built by people like Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack and then rock and roll, and then Hollywood in movies up until this day, there is a character type that when they want to create a character that's going to be somebody to be reckoned with, they're going to be somebody who does something powerful, either for good and sometimes for ill, they'll immediately write uh, a drink into their hands, and it'll be Jack Daniels' Black Label. And that all goes back to Paul Newman in the 60s with a film called HUD. It was the first major, it's an Oscar winner, where Paul Newman calls for Jack Daniels. And he's an anti-hero, which means he's going to do something powerful good, but he may not follow the rules in getting there. And we become very accustomed to that kind of hero that takes the law into their own hands to get the job done. And um, that's kind of become that, that strong person to be reckoned with it's kind of become the Jack Daniels persona, male and female. When you think about the whiskey itself, right? And this is kind of nerdy. Like it's a sweet whiskey. It's got the the charcoal process or the, the Lincoln County process, which it's come to become to known by and, and all these things, which leans it to this marshmallow, fluffy, like good mouthfeel uh, at an affordable price. Like it doesn't scream badass. <laughs> <laughs> it's from a, from from a whiskey perspective it doesn't like burn your chest it like it's just an easy drinking whiskey it, it's very fascinating you say that i mean i think if it was a very harsh whiskey it wouldn't have been as big as it is today yeah uh, now i might not go as far as marshmallow but i get it i mean the caramel yeah. uh, from the barrel uh the mellowing does its job and makes it mellow so for all of those things, it's become, it's a very approachable whiskey. And so, uh, but it has a very distinct and unique taste that holds up when you mix it with something like Coca-Cola. Yeah. You can still, still taste it. But yeah, it doesn't scream badass. And really, uh, most of our advertising has been not to counter, but to complement popular culture. And what I mean by that is, we talk about the quality of it, of the grains, of the people who make the whiskey in Lynchburg and how it's their life. We do that because, you know, we could just look. Popular culture takes us to that badass. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's funny to me. People will think they get drunk around Jack Daniels. <laughs> um, and it's like now is old number seven is 80 proof. Um it's just like uh, they'll think it's, you know, harsher. And those are all kinds of uh, things that have come out of our uh, consuming of popular culture. Yeah. It, hey, and we don't mind it. It's just uh, you really need to try the whiskey and decide for yourself what it's all about. Well, and, and that's the thing. Like a lot of times uh, people, especially in the in the whiskey industry, like – same thing for Basil Hayden. They give it a bad rap because it's 80 proof whiskey. Um, it, you don't drink it enough. We all clamor for high proof. Jack Daniels has solved everyone's problem with that. Go find you a bottle of Coy Hill and like drink uh, mm -hmm. liquid fire if you'd like to do that. Like that's your choice. Um, I don't want <laughs> anything that says hazmat on it. I could I could just live without me personally. Uh, but I yeah. know people are, are fawning over over that. Uh, whiskey in particular. Um, so they, they've answered the call um, when it comes to, to that. But I, I don't think a lot of people have sat down and had Jack in a, in a, in a pour. Now you did talk about the bonded. I thought the pond, the bonded was like right in the sweet spot. Like if you want a little more proofier Jack, but you don't want mm -hmm. a barrel proof, I thought the bonded was just a, a phenomenal way to get to, you know, 
a nice four year old, at least four years old, same distilling season, like give you all the the feels of prohibition style whiskey in new age. I, I think the bonded was a, a great representation of Jack to, to give some of that historical feel back. Yeah, I agree. And I think it too, you know, a lot of this depends on what you're doing with your whiskey. Yeah. Cocktail. I mean, bartenders and cocktail, they want a little higher proof so that it holds up when they mix it with everything. And then, you know, bonded to me is fascinating. It's created in a day, the original bonded whiskey. And, you know, all of Jack Daniels, uh, if it was bottled at 100 proof, we could call it bonded. I mean, as long as we made sure it was done within the same distilling season. The thing about bonded that I think is fascinating and needed today, it started because, you know, people were taking grain neutral spirits and mixing whatever flavors they wanted and giving it to the public and the public didn't know what they were getting. Yeah. And so bonded was the first kind of, it was the very first food safety law. Mm. And so flash forward to today, there's a lot of brands out there and you don't know where they're made and you don't know, you know, okay, it says they're bottled, but where were they distilled? You don't know. Well, one thing you can know for sure, anybody that produces a bonded whiskey, they for sure are making their own whiskey. Yeah. And I think that's just, I think that's super cool. And, you know, um, it's another thing that's just, you know, kind of crazy when you think about like the giants in whiskey and this, and I, and I wrote, I wrote uh, a little article about this, but giants and whiskeys are continuing to not only rest on their laurels, they're focused on pushing and pursuing innovation. So I compared, um, like, you know, the triple, the triple mash, like that's pushing innovation, adding in American single malt, like type of whiskey to understand, Hey, how is this going to impact not only us today, but what's the future look like? And if we release our own American single malt product, uh, and Jim Beam is doing the same thing. And I like to J- Jim and Jack kind of are like here to me, right? They're both larger in life distilleries. They're putting out a ton of whiskey that's globally recognized. And it's cool to see both of these giants tinkering at all points in time, because it's like, you don't want to rest on your laurels because, you know, even though you're producing per capita more whiskey than anyone in the world, you know, you got to be able to, to continue to innovate. And that's what I find beautiful about Jack Daniels today is, is the, the push of innovation. Well, you know, uh, as a historian, it's nice that we have a history, but today, instead of resting on that history, like you said, uh, we're making history. Yeah. And, and that's what this, the new innovations are about. Uh, that triple mash is very unique. I don't know of anybody else who could make it because we're distilling a bonded American malt, a rye, and our Tennessee whiskey all at the same location. And that's why you could say it's triple mash, but each one of those products are bonded. Yeah, I know. So very unique. It's super very unique. unique. Um, and that that leads me to, I think, the greatest myth or a question around Jack Daniels. We, we've hit on a lot of things, but it's this. Is Jack Daniels a bourbon? Yes. <laughs> and now every listener turned off the podcast, but hear no, him no, out. No. He's yeah. right about this. Let me give you the second half. So it's the answer is yes and no. Um, yes, there's a point in its life where you could call it a bourbon or the beginnings of a bourbon, and then it's charcoal mellowed. Jack Daniels, you know, bourbon is a high standard. It's a quality standard, and uh, you know, it was created. It's it's codified in law. And it's a high standard. So Jack meets all of the standard of a bourbon. It's 51%. It's more than 51% corn. It's uh, matured in white oak barrels, charred, only one use on those barrels, all the proof points that you have to do to be a bourbon, all of those things. Jack is a follows the bourbon standard, but it I like to say, does bourbon one better? Mm. It comes off the still a bourbon whiskey. It goes through 10 feet of hard sugar maple charcoal, which doesn't add flavor. It actually takes out some of the objectionable things or things that we think might interfere with the flavor coming from the barrel. So we filter it through 10 feet of charcoal. When it comes out the other side and after it's matured, 
Charcoal mellowing is what makes it a Tennessee whiskey. Uh, the federal government tried to force Jack Daniels back, I believe, in the 40s to call itself a bourbon. And Jack Daniels said there's this little clause in the bourbon standard that said, you know, it follows these things and has the character of a bourbon. And Jack pushed back. The company pushed back and said, hey, federal government, just don't go by how we meet the standard. Actually taste it against bourbon. We think it has a completely different character because of charcoal melon. And guess what? The federal government listened to the letter, tasted the whiskey, and decided, yes, you're right. It doesn't have the character of a bourbon. It has its own unique character. So you don't have to call it a bourbon. And so instead, we call it a Tennessee whiskey, which yeah. since has its own, it's been codified. And basically, it's codified to say, in, in essence, a bourbon that's been charcoal mellowed it doesn't have to be through our 10 feet, but it has to be charcoal mellowed. And different than bourbon, uh, it has to be made in this one state called Tennessee. Can, bourbon can be made anywhere in the United States. Yeah. That's, that's very true. Um, and so I find that to just be super interesting because it's been a, a hotly debated topic. Um, you know, and it's one that people get really, really upset about, um, uh, which is, is really funny to me, but you know, at the end of the day, I, I think it's, it's really awesome. Um, that, you it's know, they, funny to me too. I mean, people argue, I get that question and people argue over it. I'm going, Hey, be thankful there is a standard uh, that we can measure this stuff against that have given us these quality products. Yeah. So I, you know, I go to a restaurant and I see on the menu under bourbons, Jack Daniels is listed. I'm not bothered. It's in very good company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the really nice thing is it's uh, it just shows that it does have that quality status. Um, and, you know, Tennessee's doing something a little bit different. Tennessee's doing something a little bit different, right? Like, take again, master marketer, right? Be different. Don't just rest on, Hey, if everyone's doing it, continue to do it. Why don't you try to do something a little bit more? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, I think this is just the beginning. Um, again, we teased it. There's a whole pop culture segment that's got to come because we just hit on one movie. We hit on Frank Sinatra, but there's many more artists. There are many more, you know, folks that have interacted with Jack Daniels. And we're going to put Nelson to the test when we get him back on here to talk about all the movies and, and uh, Jack Daniels references through history and pop culture. So, uh, Nelson, just make sure you get your, your books ready. Hey, I, I will go back and, and do some more studying, but we've got everything from a Nobel Prize winning author to a Oscar winning director talking about Jack Daniels. So we've got plenty to talk about there. Um, and if people are interested, you know, some things we've got out there people might see. There's a documentary. You can get it on Amazon or Apple, uh, and that's called Chasing Whiskey. Mm. That'll give you some information. And there's a podcast that we do called Around the Barrel. Nice. So two ways you can get more information about Jack Daniels. Definitely. And tune into this program for part two. Right, there we go. But uh, I'm super excited. I didn't know about Around the Barrel, so I'm going to have to put that on my, my new uh, podcast uh, rotation. Um, so super excited. Thanks for, for sharing that. And again, Around the Barrel, go check out that Jack Daniels podcast. I got something new I need to listen to now. Um, well, Nelson, thanks again for, for this time. And, and thank you for being so gracious as just a guest to re-record the first time, the second time. <laughs> No, I, I enjoy, always enjoy talking to you and I look forward to part two. Uh, much appreciated. Well, everyone, thank you for listening to this episode of the Bourbon Lens. Um, again, you can find out more about us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Bourbon Lens. You can go over to our newly redesigned website at bourbonlens.com. Check out all the reviews. We just featured some Jack Daniels reviews on that. So go and check those out. Um, and last but not least, um, go to your favorite podcast listening app, download Around the Barrel, as well as download Bourbon Lens, uh, like, and subscribe and leave a comment. We greatly appreciate it if you did that. And until next time, cheers.